Hello, and welcome to the Creative Playing Podcast Network. Join us as we get to share some great convention panels we were able to attend at CocoCon 2019 up in Phoenix, Arizona. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the last panel open to the general public for tonight. Um, everything after this is 18 plus. So this is writing and role playing games, or writing both. We have a number of um, known experts in that area. I'm Tony Patagimus. I've written one of each. This is the book. You can buy it in the, in the dealer's room. You can play the game tomorrow night in the game room if you're interested. It's called Go Action Fun Time. It's about teenage superheroes traveling in time. Ever want to write time travel fiction? You know that you hate yourself at that point. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I will introduce, the re- let the panel introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Diana. I write most apocalyptic fiction. fiction. Also, I write um, uh, urban fantasy, which hopefully will come out this year, maybe the beginning of next. We'll see how things work out. Uh, and I'm a longtime D&D player. I also have DM'd. I didn't even know modules existed for a long, long, long time, and I kind of find them sort of boring. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my thing. I'm Beth Cato. I have uh, two series with Harper Voyager. I have the Clockwork Dagger duology and the Blood of Earth trilogy. Duncan has copies of all of those in the dealer room. Yay, Duncan! Yeah. <laughs> I'm a old school role playing game fanatic, going back to about age 11 when I really fell in love with Dragon Warrior and Final Fantasy and everything else put out by both Square and Enix, who then later formed Voltron to become Square Enix. I uh, played D&D through my teens. All of those influences are in my books. If you read through them, you will find little Easter egg tributes to all of those old games hidden within my books. Uh, just in the past year, I had the opportunity to write for my first uh, intellectual property, uh, writing a story for the Monarchies of Mal role-playing game setting, which is uh, essentially a fantasy with humanoid cats. That's like the post-apocalyptic Earth, but cats have taken over and send it along with it's the larger setting is Pugmire with dogs, but I wrote for the cats because I am a definite cat person. Hi, uh, my name is Floyd Getchell. I'm an independent author. I've been playing. The, I actually found out my original Dungeons and Dragons book, which are first hardcover print editions, are worth a whole lot of money now. Uh, people are like, "Yeah, you should sell them." I'm like, "Yeah, right." Um, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, and I'm like, "You module stink." Um, give me a real dungeon master anyway. Uh, I just realized something as you were talking about putting stuff in your deal. I'm thinking I don't have any of my books here that actually have game influence in them, which is actually not true. This one, uh, Pilgrim's Trail, this is part of the trilogy. Um, He actually jumps into uh, Battletech influence body armor. And uh, it's, this book series started off uh, Firefly Serenity, that's where it started off as, um, because, uh, well, we all thought Josh Whedon made some errors in there. Uh, Anyway, (laughs) so I get 20,000 words into it, and I have, uh, it's written from the other side of it, the guy's in the ranger service, law enforcement, he's sitting in the ring room, he's captured his main suspect, and I just said, hey, um, why don't we have, is it? Goes, is there anybody else that's being held against her will? And I said, what if an artificial intelligence uh, android steps forward and says, yes, I am. Oh, interesting. So that set me off on a totally different course.
person and I had to do a whole bunch of research about artificial intelligence, I didn't realize, it's gonna sound arrogant, and I apologize, but I've sat in symposiums and stuff like that, and you need to be kind of moving. As far as artificial intelligence theory goes, I'm kind of up there. Um, and I know that sounds arrogant, folks, but um, it just happened that way because of the level of research I did with it. Um, and the people I, I talked to in the circle of life traveling. Um, we're just supposed to keep going all the way. No, no, no. no. You're introducing yourself. I'm introducing myself. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then I, I've written a bunch of other books that have influences against you. I brought some of those direct influences with me. Go ahead. Hello. Hello. Um, my name is Stephanie Whiteford, and I have two books out. Um, Though Duncan sold all of one of them. Nice. <laughs> That one is Sweet Secrets. It is available on Amazon and, of course, through uh, Tenth Doppel Press. And um, all, the one that he still has copies of is called Word of Chaos, which has some gaming elements in it. Because, yeah, I'm D and D. They're kind of like who hasn't, um, in a way. And but mostly, it's running off of. Um, Hollywood tropes and Road to Chaos is off of the old Road to pictures. That, um, those old, those old, old black and white movies. But there are um, uh, gaming references in in the in my writing in places because it has there's uh, pacing that we'll do, especially in story games and. There'll, uh, there'll be pacing issues and things that you have to ha get done before you can go on to the and so yeah. Um, I'm also in uh, the More Alternative Truths anthology series from B Cube Press. I'm in More Alternative Truths and Endgame. If you like political fiction, they're awesome books. Um, and last but not least, I do have Refrigerator Magnets. If anyone is interested in having one, it's it's encouraging you to do your art because we need more art, more create, sure. less hate. Yes. There, yeah. that's an intro. All right. So I don't know about you, which is why I'm asking. I first learned to write on deadline through high school. I learned to do it as a dungeon master because my oh. friends were coming over Friday night yes. and this thing wasn't close to done. So I'm wondering if you, any of you had a similar experience where you basically started writing on deadline or under pressure and role playing games first as opposed to like, you know, normal fiction. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Because that pressure is right there. Yes. Right? They're coming over and you have to have it done. And then you get them in the game and they go this way. And you're like, <laughs> I just spent weeks <laughs> on this work. You know, the few times I've DM'd, I've gotten to where, okay, this is a situation, and I want them to eventually end up in this castle. And I'm gonna do everything else on the fly because you can't, you can't I anticipate can't. that. No, that's they will right be at the beginning though, you think you know what they're going to do. Yeah. So then you have to learn to I'm be more for, flexible. <laughs> I'm unsure for writing books. Yeah. Because then, damn it, they're going to do what I need them to do. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know where it helped me, though, was in world building. Mm -hmm. that's, oh, yeah. that's where, and, it, I, and I apologize, uh, it, I find it somewhat amusing to me now, where people struggle, and I, I really want, that's one of the things I proposed as a participant, is let me help others world build, because it's something I do, read this, this actually, I had a second chapter in there, and I had three alien worlds just boom, boom, boom. And when that book first came out, it actually lost the reader because I had hero protagonist chapter, blah, 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 situation, jump. We're talking about three alien worlds, and then jump back to hero protagonist doing his thing in the third chapter, and I totally lost my reader. So I actually had to take that in the second printing of this and go put it in the back of the book so that I could keep the story rolling along. But and it's right. something because of Dungeons and Dragons and creatively writing and world building, 
that it allowed, and now I can just roll with world building and really it's something that comes I, that I can do really easily that I found other writers struggle with. But they, I can trace that all the way back to creating worlds. No matter what dragons. game you play, Dungeons and Dragons or Shadowrun or what was the one? Or was it RPG? Uh, I was a Jackson. Dragon. Dragonlance was the one I was rolling. Yeah, that's fun. It was it was one in space where you were hopping. You had jump drive and you were just hop from here. Probably travel. Traveler. Traveler. Were they black books? Black books? Yeah, yeah, there was yeah, Traveler. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, that was, that was a great one. That was a huge one. That is a still. You could die during consecration. Yeah. You can still play. You can still buy a new Traveler product. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And and that was and that was one. That, honestly, the funniest thing in the world. I used to have tons of that. Never actually played the game. Oh wow. Yeah. We'll I mean, that. you want so, to, and then you don't. You can't find a group that's playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So you you get into it, and you're you're making characters and planning worlds, and then you know, kind of. Okay. See, that's what I did more often. My with my brother, we had a number of role playing game books, including for a Star Wars role playing game in the '90s, and then I had tons of Dragonlance material. But we did D and D for a while with a group, and then it kind of died out. And so I would just research and study the books and develop all of these characters that nothing ever happened. Yeah, that's, that's and, but that was also, prefer that's how, because I never DM, that's really where I was having fun and I was drawing their pictures mm -hmm. and I would even draw oh. maps and do all this stuff, but oh, never okay. actually got to utilize yeah, it. So, so perhaps we all learn how to cope with the grief that our world war <laughs> <laughs> is we never see the light of day. Yeah. Yes. Either because the editor doesn't care or the players never got there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I had fun with it. Yeah. It's Learning to suffer in silence. <laughs> but having that layer, even if they, even if it never gets used in the book or never, um, the, the it's players played. go, yeah, it never gets played. It's really um, it still gives a depth to the world mm -hmm. because even if you don't actually know it's there, it is there. And so it kind of it gives it more st more realism to what they do experience. Well, and right. it also gives you a backstory to develop your character against. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the the, th the funny thing is, is you have to, like I'll do this uh, times when I'm uh, I will I, I have to I have a rule now that every um uh, what is it? It's every. Uh, I want to say every hundred pages, but that's not right. It's uh, every so often I have a certain word count on it. I can't remember what it is right now. That uh, and I'll I'll search. I'll do a word search for that character, and if they don't appear in so many pages, I actually will do a character description because I know my characters. I'm very familiar with my characters, but the reader, the average reader, is not. And so I have to go back and redress it, and I do triggers with my characters yeah. and things like that. Because, you know, I'm like you're saying the depth of character there mm -hmm. and whatnot. I love my characters, I know my characters and things like that, but they don't know. And you have to watch the name homophones, you know, and things like that. Like right now in this series I have two characters that are named Wyatt, and I have to keep them, you know. Oh that would be very confusing. Yeah, you would get one of them and they And one of them one of them has changed his name to Ryan. It used to be and so it's like the book's almost over, so they'll survive. <laughs> yeah, I well, I had to do something like that in Sweet Secrets because the um, the portal to the world where the magic works, the magic works by cooking. Where it does is it's I wanted to pull from different cultures, so I had to think, well, how would I get like Romans and Japanese people in the same place. Oh, well, if you had an ice age, it would bring everybody down to the center, and so they'd be a lot closer. And so I had to look up what are, what the earth was like during the uh, ice age. And that's not, the only, there's a one line mention in the book, but I did all the research to get it all set up on how it would work and the weather patterns, and I, 
<coughs> and um, also, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when you were saying the research for that, I was going, oh yeah, I understand. Cause, and, and I also had to go down through the animals because I, um, one of my beta readers just absolutely adored the fact that um, it was, I think it was a typo originally, but I had a six-legged squirrel in the park. And my reader, beta readers just absolutely loved it. So I had to figure out, okay, how would I have a six-legged squirrel, a six-legged rodent with two-legged humans? And so I had to find the place in the world tree that I would sniff off the, and yeah, that's a lot of research. <laughs> I think one good thing about about being involved in role playing games is that you just build this world and you don't have to apologize for how it is. You don't have to apologize there's dragons, you don't have to apologize there's ogres or whatever. That's the world and you built it and your characters have to face it. So now you've got a book and I remember when I first started writing feeling I'll I'll explain this to like a embarrassing and so then it's like you just have to embrace it just like you would a game and say no this is the world and these are the rules and this is how this works and it, it just makes it so much easier if you just say this is my world I get to do what I want with it just like I would in game. you have to accept your god yeah yes yeah. Yeah. like and then yeah and then the opposite is true when I'm writing the hard science fiction here is I have to, uh, like in one of the instances where we made contact with aliens, we couldn't talk to them because they, um, they had a high level of arsenic in their atmosphere, and we couldn't talk to them at all. And so, or we couldn't uh, communicate with them directly. We had to be all suited up and whatnot. And so that was a huge impetus. We descend from the heavens, so what if they can think we are? They can think we're gods. Then the god that they started erecting uh, statues and things like that. So I had to create a whole biosphere around that. And so the, the suspension of disbelief, yeah, when you're writing in the uh, role playing game world, you are, you do, you can create that whole thing. But you don't have to apologize you, for anything. If you start right. making it unbelievable, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it, and then it's it like, it's like, okay, my suspension of disbelief is broken now. I'm not enjoying this game anymore. So you have to still be able to yeah. make it something that would be believable. Yeah. So if it's a space game, you know, you have to be able to go there. You have yeah. to have enough sound to know what you're talking about. Well, I have a related question then for everyone. When you're writing, do you kind of write uh, almost like a rule book for your world, whether it's for magical, for science fiction, to kind of act as a guideline to, to, frame it. to, yeah, to frame it for you, for reference, to make sure it's for consistency? Because I tend to do that kind of thing, especially with my magic. This is the steps. These are the herbs that are necessary for the healing magic. This is what's necessary to successfully heal someone and do things like that. That way, I almost have a checklist for when I'm going through an editing. It's like, am I doing my own magic right? And I go through and check that. Well, I mean, not. I don't. I don't think I have like a little rule book for myself. Okay. And for me, it's a word. It's like a word doc. Yeah. That I just track it. Yeah. Well, I, I track things in a word doc. When I track characters. I track different plot lines that I, I, I'm using or not using. I track places and timelines, but I don't, don't go, I think I kind of know how the world is. And the character in the fantasy novel is a person who already has, she's a psychic, so she already has something that normal people don't know okay. about. So she's going forward and discovering that there are other people that are abnormal too. So it's like a discovery and the reader gets to go along. Um, the um, this book here, this series here is hilarious because uh, it, our physics is my rule book, right? But it deals with dark matter, dark energy. Okay. And we figured, we figured out that uh, dark matter, dark energy is something that you can control with electricity. And so we use it to travel through space and create a dark matter field and you can actually use it to connect uh, Einstein, Rose, and Bridge events and travel. You can do off through space and stationary events you can connect. Um, and create wormholes, control wormholes, takes a lot of energy. Using right? dark energy. Using dark energy and dark matter, right? See, and I get the same physicist. <laughs> and, they look at me, and they go, but we don't know that. But you don't know I'm wrong either. <laughs> That's your opinion. And it was so, I was at Condor Con, and they had a whole bunch of Astro in uh, San Diego a year and a half ago, and it was hilarious, and they were looking at me the same way. And, um, and it was like, 
well, we don't know you can do that. And I was like, well, we don't know you don't. Right. Don't know if you can. Talk to and, so, and so, um, you, uh, in the uh, Chronicles of Riddick, when the um, that uh, the ships are coming down from the uh, what was it, the Necromonger, and they um, have the that dark mist around the vehicles. That's how I visualize that dark matter being used as a buffer state to suspend the ships. That's what I visualize that as, and so. And I thought, okay, that's and that's what you know. I wrote that this a month before that, and um, and so that's how I visualized that. And, and so I kept using that, and they um, they use it uh, uh, for anti gravitational purposes and stuff like that. You magnify it and or you magnify it and move around, and move it around. And those are you know I get you know over oh, bending the rules of physics. How do we freaking know? We just the only way we know that dark matter exists is through gravitational lensing. And so, things like that. And so you know, you're playing with you're you're filling in the blanks in the rule book. Yeah, exactly. And and, and it's, it's so funny to watch these astrophysicists brains melt. Like, we don't know that. And we'll, well, we don't know. We don't know that either. <laughs> Had a lot of fun. They did. One of them quit talking and was a friend of mine. Like, <laughs> <laughs> whatever, dude. You're gonna be like, well, we do eventually find out what it is, and you're wrong. You'll be like the people who thought that um, uranium would make plants grow faster in the 40s. Or well, then they were well, what, if I'm, what if I'm yeah. right? I'm right. a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's a good gamble. You know, I kind of cool. Still You're ready for it. Yeah. 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 A lot of the science and Heinemann and Asimov are is it as good as we thought it was back then. The, the books right. are still good to me. I oh, still yeah. will read yeah. those books. I mean... The, uh, I have, I got, I've got one that's actually related to that. This is a hilarious. I, I wrote this. This is actually a sequel to H. Or H. Wilson of the Worlds. And uh, because I got, being a history, I'm a history um, scholar and reason history, and the, um, I got done reading it. I don't know if anybody's read the original H. Wilson of the Worlds. I pushed it forward. Um, I think four years it was supposed to happen in 1896. A lot of this technology comes available in the turn of the century. And what I did is I, uh, Victorian England never would have taken that. Never would have taken a uh, smackdown by aliens and <coughs> done something. They would have counterattacked Mars. They would have figured out how to go and attack Mars. This is the book mm. of the counterattack on Mars. Okay, and what I did is I took what we actually know about Mars now. The actual facts of Mars. This isn't a steampunk book, but people have just totally adopted it as a steampunk book. People will say anything that said it, people will say it. <laughs> I know. It's, it's That's so hard. That's what I get on the cover of the the, um, Well, what I did, I, I overthink stuff. This is actually the same cover the book came out in originally. So, oh. you know, there are like two people in the world that know that, me and oh. me, some other nerd. <laughs> <laughs> But um, that's the same. That's the same cover that Wells Fargo had on, right? So yeah, I overthought that one. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, yeah. So um, anyway, so the uh, yeah, good one, Floyd. Uh, so anyway, the um, then that's the diary of the lieutenant colonel. And in, in the original book, there's a artillery battery that knocks over one of the walkers, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the battery commander is uh, Prince Edward gets a hold of him. Says you're going to leave the counter that your reverse engineer and stuff, and they go to Mars as we know it now. The funniest thing in the world is um, when I first wrote the book, I sent them <coughs> up there with um, the, the understanding of uh, Einstein's relative. Um, yeah, Einstein's uh, relative. Uh, Relativity, relativity right, and, the gravity, and understanding your gravity. They wouldn't have had that. No, they wouldn't have had They would have had, yes. They would have had. Newtonian. No, it was, um, no, what's his name? Apple fell on his head. Newton. 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 They would have had Newtonian. They would have had Newtonian. They would have had Newtonian. 
Yeah, it would have been Newtonian physics. It would physics. have been classics physics. Yeah, they would have thought gravity was constant with a slight transition as you transition between the gravity of, so when they get up just out of the atmosphere and gravity lets go of them, mm -hmm. then they would have been surprised by that. So I had to go back and rewrite it. It was actually a publication for like two weeks and I went, oops, <laughs> wait a minute. Hey, hey, time out, we gotta go rewrite this. But anyway, that was a pretty funny one, talking about the limits and stuff like that. Do any of, I used to read, we'll get one more question and we'll get to all you guys. I used to read the books that TSR would put out, novel based mm. on the series, yep. and I could just see the spells working in those things. How hard have you guys had to work to hide your actual rules? Mm. Hide the rules? Hide the rules in the narrative fiction. It's about pacing for me. Yeah. You, and it's like you were saying, where you pace it out so that you discover it. So With your character, character discovers certain things right. along the way. They, can't they think they know the rules, right. and then mm -hmm. it changes. Right. So you're talking right. about um, hiding the rules of magic from the reader? Uh, well, disguising the fact that you're going off known rules, right? So there's Not making a, it read like it's just a how-to, you know, right. step by step. No, you can't. It's like you, oh, can no, show. you cannot tell. Right. 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 That's mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah. Well, one you're of showing. the tricks that I use, which lots of other writers use, is have somebody who doesn't do the magic be the point of view person that you're using. I did that in <coughs> Road to Chaos. The um, uh, Robert is, well, he managed to get through algebra in high school, and this math, this uh, magic system is based upon higher math. So he is just like, his eyes are spinning. So, to, to him, it, it even when they try to explain something to him, vital parts are going to be going over his head, and so that keeps. Uh, but but the reader could still tell if it's not consistent. So you do need the rules, but right. you don't have to tell them the right. rules. You just show them as the uh, occasion comes up through the point of view. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Excellent. We uh, this gentleman is very patient with. <coughs> Um, so the, you had mentioned that you have a background in history. Yes. It makes me wonder, um, for everybody, when you're, when you, when you come up with a world building idea, how, how often do you have a world building idea that's somehow connected to the sort of knowledge or expertise that you have? How often do you have an idea and go, I need to research that idea? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about tomorrow. Yeah, I would. Yeah, oh, we're just surviving the historical. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So be there for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's always things that you have to research, though. It's like even if you're doing a game, if you're building a game, um, there are things, and go back to the book and figure out what's possible and what you can do and what you can put your players through. And, um, there's always research. Don't look yes. at my browser history. It's a okay. marker uh, of my character. How <laughs> <laughs> to murder with yeah. yeah. no, I'm, I'm on FBI watch list. I mean, I just I know. Oh, I know I am. <laughs> Not the one I'm you, but I used to be on the KGB. <laughs> oh, that's impressive to get in a foreign country. It was, it was, it was because I was in the, uh, where I was at, and, you know, I was an Army Ranger at one time, and we were just all on by default on the KGB's watch list. So it must be your search history. <laughs> not, not because of book research. No, but I will call my friends and say, okay, how does this weapon work again? Or, okay, I need a poison. <laughs> nice. And I want it to be indetectable by taste, but they have to die three painfully. Well, that's the fun. I, I, yes. have, I have a couple really good books on poison that are really yes. good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can read those things. I've, I've, sure. I've actually used RPG source books. For research, I, I know the army manuals. Exactly army where they got. Those. I read. Oh yeah, the yes, army yes. war yeah. to help me yeah, with I, yes. this book. Okay, mm -hmm. I mean, and I had to figure out how to do guerrilla warfare. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, like that. And you have to do that. It's like you have to know this stuff. You can't just write about it and say somebody isn't going to come back and say this is stupid. Okay. <laughs> Some uh, subject matter story. expert. Oh, thank you. Very much. I I see. Yeah. <laughs> I've read somebody writing me going, well, you know, they wouldn't have done it that way because they really wouldn't have. It, evolution Can would I, not have worked that way. I got I got one for you. Uh, Harry, you guys know Harry Turtledove? Yes. Yes. Okay, Harry Turtledove. God talked to him and he said I could tell this story. 
Um, he um, actually, Fitz, I'll tell the history one. He actually uh, was, um, the, they wouldn't do it that way. He got a letter one time, uh, his Guns of the South book, right? This is the most famous book yeah. where he, time travelers go back and they give uh, AK-47s to the Confederacy and they fight the Civil War in the Rock. And then history actually turns out the way they didn't want it. So any of the uh, South African white supremacist guys. Anyway, so um, he had a, uh, in there, he had, what's George Washington's birthday? 19th February or something like that, 21st February? Yeah, yeah, right there. Okay, he, in the original printing of the book, he had the, the telegraph, they got a telegraph in Richmond, Virginia, that on the 19th February, blah, 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 he gets this letter from a historian, and you gotta understand that Terry Turbo has got his doctorate in history, and he um, <laughs> gets this 12-page long single-space letter, sir, I do not wish to take up a lot of your time, but. <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> Yeah, and um, the telegraph office would not have been open on that day because the, um, yeah, uh, he actually, him and I got into a uh, discussion. Oh um, There's always an expert that is more of an expert than yeah. yeah. your yeah. expert, and I'm sorry for any reader that finds an inconsistency, but I did my best. Yeah. 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 And you have to accept that. Yes. Yeah, I, Harry Turlock was at CocoCon last year as guest of honor, and yeah. he was really he was oh, very nice. He was here. Yeah. Oh, he was here? Oh, yeah, this, okay. yeah, very, this weekend. Last year. Yeah, last year. That's how we know That's how you guys all know him. I missed him. He's a very nice no. man. No, he's, very nice. Uh, that's, I, I have a, I'm going to tell this other story at the history thing, uh, and, and I interacted, and, uh, and he said I could tell the story, actually. Yeah. Duncan, do you have signed books by any? Yes, I do. Okay, so I'd give you a plug for that. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Duncan has all the good books. Um, actually, I can pick this up since it just killed the conversation. I'm I have a book that uh, actually is out of print right now. Uh, someday they're going to let me do a, um, it's a, my first novel, it's called, it was originally called Capitulation, you know how a book sells, the title sells the book, what the hell does that mean, right? Capitulation. The new title is Alien Copper Conspiracy, and um, it is being rewritten now, you can look it up on uh, Amazon, um, but uh, it's my first novel. And uh, the presentation I want to do is everybody's first novel, and for an hour I'll sit up there in front of uh, everybody and just make fun of myself. It's got an atrocious cover on it. Um, the book uh, is just hilarious. There were three characters in there that just fall off the pages of the book. You don't know what happened to them. Uh, <laughs> just all, basically, basically every mistake you can. Anyway, that actually started out, we were talking about Battletech earlier, that actually started out was, there used to be a, I don't know if it's still in Vegas or not, it was a place called Virtual World. And you used to be able to crawl into Virtual World and get actually in a cockpit, and it had all these Mac computers hooked up to each other, and you could run around on a battlefield like you're playing Battletech. And it was a blast. And so I'm driving through the desert in New Mexico on 10, from uh, Las Cruces to um, towards Tucson, and I go, man, it would be so fun to be ripping through here, just blowing shit up, yep. right? That is on page 196 of that book. You're in a situation, you say, you know what would be really cool is if this could happen, and then, you know, that could go in this little section mm -hmm. here where I could totally mm -hmm. make this into a story. I'm gonna yep. do that. Well that's, well, that's actually how that whole novel started, and then I built, Mm -hmm. That whole book around that, that's aliens and yeah. and Earth and on and on. Virtual World's gone, but they have those battle tech yeah. projects. Right. So, um, that's your point. Have you ever had an idea, like a book or a story, and tried it out with gaming, like with your players? It's like you're, you're testing? Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> you are experiment victims, let's do this. Yep. <laughs> I have not. Um, I personally, answer too. I personally no. have not, but one of my writer friends up in Seattle has, her name is Jean Johnson. She has um, a book called The Tower, 
and everything in that book she swears to me she's done to her gaming group. <laughs> and there are some very interesting things in that book at the tower, and I'm going, they still like you? <laughs> stories where I said, okay, I want to see if this works. It's a one-off. Let's just try this. And okay, that won't work, but this will. So, okay. I know. I've done action scenes where I've actually gotten out the miniatures oh, yeah. and laid them out oh. so I knew where everyone was at this point. And then we move around and make sure that it all tracked with the, uh, what I was actually writing. Yeah, I've, I've actually um, I've thought out scenes to create. I have a series that isn't published or anything we call uh, Dark Angel. Now, for the thing with uh, like what's your face getting on Jessica Alba came out. This is uh, yeah, it's uh, Dark Angel, and um, it's another bad tech thing. But um, I fought that one out to create Dark Angel because the battle tech engine is that's how it got its name. All screwed yeah, up. Yeah, and you do write what you know. So like yes. when I lived in Japan, I learned how to do judo. So I do use judo, and I, I you know, do yoga, so I do use yoga, and or whatever it is that I need to get the characters to physically do, I usually will figure it out how I could do it, or how someone else could do it, and that feels that I can't write about things that I don't know about, unless I do a ton of research. Mapping things out really helps. I have a yeah. short story that has a human players who are stuck on an alien space station, they were supposed to go to an intergalactic Olympics and they end up stranded on this icy station. And there's a pivotal hockey game that they end up playing on this station. And I'm, we're season ticket holders for the Coyotes, so I have basic knowledge of hockey, but it's not my expertise. So I definitely, my husband actually took, he, he drew, you know, just like you would see, you know, a coach drawing it out for a hockey game. And we mapped out, this is where this player is, okay, here's where your goalie is. And we went through the whole scene for, for, for the climax, and I and I still kept that because it was the one time where we, yeah. it was like our battle map, and it was a hockey game. Absolutely. And I have gone to like Google Maps because this is post apocalyptic Google Maps is fantastic. Right? Yes. So <laughs> we're awesome. now in Colorado, and now we've got these, these people that are trying to fight off the invaders, and so where would be a good place for an ambush? And so here I am on Google Maps, like, Oh, this would be pretty good to know this, you know, and then, well, how can we sweep them all away? And it's like, I use that constantly. Yeah, I use Google Maps when I needed to know what Tibet looks like, the countryside of Tibet, um, and where the major cities were. And how did um, writers write without right? <laughs> 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 Conspiracy that really bit me in the rear because I was sitting there. I was I tried to. The reason that book is so huge is because I tried to I wrote about people in Africa, Australia, uh, Asia, you know, all over the world because um, I wanted to be inclusive. And um, I wrote about Australia and I looked on Google Earth and all that stuff. And then I actually went to Australia. Oh my, it's very different from what you see in the pictures. And I realized I, I actually had I went back and I rewrote that because okay. it's very different mm -hmm. from the pictures you see on your um, oh. yeah you know, outback the outback is a different a very different place than what you see in pictures. Google mm -hmm. Earth helps a lot, but it's outback. another thing. So it's yeah. very it's, actually, yeah. it's a tool. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a tool. Um, oh, to add another way that my um, role playing game helps me in writing, if I have to come up with um, the bad guys surprise my uh, pro tag in a hallway, and I don't know how many of them, but it's going to be enough, so it's got to be at least two, but more than five would not fit in this hallway. Okay, one D4. And that's how many. <laughs> I've done that. Nice. <laughs> that's hilarious. I love that. You just keep your mind. Yeah. 
Okay. Is that why I bought you dice? <laughs> <laughs> I declined to answer on the grounds that it means. Well, they actually <laughs> literally sell storytelling dice. They're yeah. Like, yeah. Kids yeah. Story guns. Guns. And, can, and they're also yeah. some online engines that people have created. Yeah. 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 I had too much yeah. 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 to let someone take over and tell me why. I had, um, I, I've been working on this book for a long time, and, and I'm going to actually get into this more of the history thing, but it's working titles, The History of World War II. You may ask why, how can you have a book about something that hasn't existed yet? It's alternate history. Well, and I think, I think anyone at this con would go, would that completely accept that they have a question. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so anyway, so anyway, the uh, the premise of the book is uh, we don't drop uh, Japan surrenders before we do Japan, and because somebody said something on the History Channel that pissed me off, and they started researching. So, um, yeah, they just stopped researching. Yeah, they started researching. So, what yeah. would happen if that indeed happened? And that's actually where these two little tiny models come from. Because if you look closely at the Sherman, it doesn't look like an actual Sherman thing. And then the other piece of hardware there is a German. Uh, it's called a kitten in uh, Altdeutsch, and uh, it is a fictitious uh, armored. First, I'll show you if you're ever ready to go. And this one that surprisingly has a 50 caliber US paint on it. Anyway, so World War II uh, ends, and then the Russians decide that they want to continue the party because they don't think our nukes are going to work, and that's a fact. I researched the heck out of this, and um, I think it's out of control. I, yeah, I can see how it was. So, anyway, um, oh, that's a rabbit hole. So, anyway, and this, and I war game. Okay, we're talking about gaming here. I war game in N scale, and I'm needless to say, got probably way too many of these little tiny things in this scale. Um, so, everybody, yeah, and now we've answered the other mystery why is Boyd single? So, or, or the other paradox, Boyd is single, and that's why he can have all these things. So, <laughs> so anyway, yeah. well, so <laughs> correlation does not equal causation. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so there anyway, might be, there might be personality reasons why. The, um, ouch! Ouch! ouch. ouch. Oh, <laughs> David. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't you brought him off, and then you took him right back like down. <laughs> <laughs> build you up and then blow your I'm sure he'll find an attractive nurse for the firm war. I'm a retired senior NCO of the United States Army. My skin is probably actually yeah. bulletproof. <laughs> so anyway. But um but yeah, it's um it's funny the paradox of that book because it there is a well, the other reason I started writing it is because there is this it, if you go on to uh, GHQ they are the guys that make micro armor and they have this uh, it's called Vermont 47 and their premise is it drives me crazy this this story is, is that the we didn't Hitler doesn't declare war on the United States on December 8th. And so we don't uh, fight them, we go fight the Japanese. That never, ever would have happened in a bazillion and seven years if you no. know anything about history. Because we were all. already supporting Great Britain. Yeah, thank you. I know. My mom is a historian. Anything. I know this by Yeah, so story. anyway, and so the Germans got on it. It's just so you can play with all the cool things the Germans were thinking about maybe at the end of the oh. war. So anyway, and that's one of the, the kids in one of those things. So anyway, more likely what would have happened is Japan would surrender early. We don't nuke them. Stalin decides he wants to party and take the rest of Germany, and that was a really scary night when I was in Potsdam researching this, and I actually found where Stalin, in fact, said that. Did I go looking for it? No, I'm not that kind of a researcher. I don't go in with preconceived biases, because it just makes you a crummy researcher, okay? 
But anyway, so that's where those come from. That's why I bought them. Right. Sometimes the truth is stranger than anything you could ever think right. of. Yeah. Yeah. Believe me, when you come to my thing tomorrow, I think what I discovered, I'm just sitting there. I, well, two and, two and, and a half weeks ago, I figured this out. And I, A, can't figure out nobody else figured this out before. B, somebody else had explanations for what I discovered are hilarious. And I mean, it's just, it's amazing. It, it was like a key that unlocks all this stuff about ancient Egypt. It was just absolutely amazing when I found out. Anyway, sorry. That's my personal plug for my amazing life. But anyway. But yeah, that history of World War III, hopefully, I've been writing that book for freaking 10 years now. I actually lost over 100,000 words on it when my computer crashed, <gasps> right? And then who knew spilling coffee on over an SD card erases it? Oh. I did not know that. Oh. Do you have any wow. backups? Question for that. So, that if was, he had backups, out of curiosity, he lost um, 100,000 words. Just going off the role playing game, and I apologize if this was handled before I got yet back in the room. But um, uh, actually, I think it's probably pertaining a little more to the ladies on the panel. But in role playing games, a lot of times, they, even though historically we hear about, or in many things we hear about, the male characters and the female characters have their definite role. In role playing games, the female characters can pretty much play the exact same role as the male characters. Do you find, has that ever really helped you, hindered you, does it bother you, it, it does it, how, how does that work into your writing, the sexism slash non-sexism? So when I first started, I graduated high school in 1980, that makes me 57. So when I first started playing d and I was still a teenager, I wanted to play and the boys wouldn't let girls play. So I would read all the books, and I would make all these maps, and I would do all these things, and I had all these characters, but I couldn't play for a long time. And I found a group when I lived overseas of all guys, all playing D&D, &D, and I got the nerve to approach them and say, can I play? And they let me play, and they become my, they're still my very good friends. I still kept in touch with them, and they're still my very good friends. Um, but they had ideas about what female characters were and were not, and I got to work in the game, and it was nice. And so, yeah, I, I could see how it helps build the characters if you can play these games with men and women mm -hmm. so that they can say, no, that's not going to fly. Guys, no, you got to do that. It's a pal. She's going to wear armor and not a bikini. Okay, right. just, <laughs> just please pay attention. Okay. <laughs> For my Clockwork Dagger books, the inspiration behind that was because as a teenager when I was, because I, 1991, 1992, I fell for Final Fantasy II for Super Nintendo, going by the original American number for the game. And then soon after fell for Dragonlance and the adult fantasy section at the bookstore. And I always wanted, because I love the healer characters, the white wizards, the priestesses, the clerics, whatever it's called in the different settings. And I crave that, I love finding in the books, but they were always the sidekick. And typically as the woman, it was you know the nurturing female, keeping the big girly hero alive, and that was the dynamic I saw over and over again in video games and in books. And it gets tiresome. It gets tiresome, and I wanted to see the healer as the main character. And I never could find that. So years passed, and I decided to, as an adult, you know, well, I'm gonna go back to my childhood dream, and I'm going to, Right. trying to be a published novelist, I wanted to write the book that I never found. You got to write the book you wanted to write. I, I, I yes. did, and, and, that, and people read it, and they pick up the Final Fantasy influences and things like that. And to me, and people love it because it is different, because you do have the character who is normally the demoted sidekick, and they are the main character, and they own the book, and it, it, I wrote it in a way that it works. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that was decades that I finally got fed up and made it from reality. Are you though? Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 I wanted to, uh, 
Yeah, after you did that, I'm just going to say that um, I work real hard to make sure my folks pass the special test. Go both ways too. You don't want to be invisible men. You want a good mix of men and women that are strong and weak and human. Right. Yeah. So in um, Road to Chaos, right. I have more um, competent female professors that are in the book and named and talk and do things than I do male professors. Um, because, well, women can do math. I, I enjoy math. I'm one of those people. So they would be great at the, at the magic system I'm doing. Not for you. <laughs> <laughs> Victorian England, but so obviously male driven, right? However, wife stows aboard the space, one of the spaceships. Good. Becomes, yeah, becomes, uh, because the alien, you know, I won't spoil the plot, but women are important in the book. Pilgrim's Trail series, flawed male protagonist, and the true uh, hero of the book is female. I won't go into that because I know better. <laughs> no, it's, no, I think the world is shifting. I think well, that things are evolving so that people. In like some them. ways, but. You look, at, yeah. you look at history, though, and there are so many instances where there is a, uh, a woman that doesn't get credit for it. It sure. absolutely drives me. In the presentation I gave yesterday, there was a um, woman that made this incredible discovery, archaeological discovery, that showed that the uh, uh, North America was. Uh, Occupied by uh, uh, Homo, or, uh, Homo erectus a mm -hmm. uh, quarter of a million years ago. Are you talking about the Clovis points that they found? No, no, this is because they Clovis. found the same Clovis points in North um, North uh, Europe that, and North America. Clovis points are almost eighty. Yeah, those are us. Oh, we made a real one recent. Yeah. No, this is this is the uh, way you almost wrecked too oh. much of it. Yeah. Oh. A quarter of a million years ago. So what happened to the woman who discovered this? Oh, they oh, said they she couldn't have discovered this because she was a girl. Uh, Cynthia Irwin Williams, Dr. Cynthia Irwin Williams. Uh, I mean, they had a, an oil company dated this site. They have absolutely no vested interest in this at all. Why are we off subject? Um, but anyway. Anyway. But, yeah, um, so my, the last question I have prepared, which has been harder? to keep somewhere near your outline? The player characters at the table, or the characters in your head? Oh, you know, they both run away. Yeah. <laughs> they do. Yes. But, I mean, I maybe my not myself. I have learned through hard experiences, you can't force your character, no, and you can't force your players. You have to let them run as they go. Otherwise, it's just not fun. They have more fun. Yeah, you have to be true to your character. Yeah. Yeah. You could make them do something, right, but it would out be of character, false. your reader will notice. Well, they need agency. You can't, right. you can't have the plot be what's in control, though. Yes. Right. The players or the characters have to be the ones who right. take the agency. I'm, I'm a seat of your pants author. I write, I don't, yeah, I think, I, I, I sound like you're I, 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 I don't like crazy. I, I said, am, I am, I am kind of a hybrid, because I have, okay, we're starting at A, I want to hit G over here and get this, and then that's where I'm going. Yeah. And then I'm kind of like the perambula, the, the drunk coming home from the bar. You call I learned process. that they call us puzzlers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is she, then he said uh, Diana Gabaldon does that, set where she'll do just different scenes and then put it's them all a, together. Yeah. See, Maybe. that's what I did for my first novel. It was any fun, and so I'm totally seated the pants. I start, it's almost, it's really cool because when I sit down to write, guys, it's like you're reading it. I don't know where it's going. Yeah, I have no clue. It's so fun. It's like I'm reading it for the first yeah. time as I'm oh, writing it. And it's just you're, such a you're blast. You're telling yourself And I'm like, yeah. And I'm just cranking it out. And I'm like, oh, God, this guy just did this. This is so pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, now i got to change this scene back. No, no, no. Oh, you have to do no, that. Just... <laughs> <laughs> so that's where having a deep world build and, you know, some idea of how all the mechanics work come to your advantage, because when your characters wander off the map, either at the table or you know, just in your head. I don't need to plot out 
exactly yeah, what, you're, but I know how the world is. Yes, so, so you can there is sometimes you have to go back and figure out wait a minute, is this there so they can do that? Especially when they're yeah. like I'm got characters that are jumping between planets and stuff like that, and you have to go, wait a minute, where the hell is that planet right now in the <laughs> rotation around the Tau City solar system? Oh my god, oh I can put out my map of whatever. Right. Or other mass. Things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And right. you sometimes have to make sure that that island that you want off of the coast of Chile actually isn't plausible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this will be the last call for questions. We're uh, coming up on time. Oh yeah, five minutes. Mm -hmm. Do you have a map of all the star system? Yeah. And you like plug in a date and figure out figure out. It's where just a PowerPoint of there. I took the star chart of Tau City. Oh, that was a fun one because they I they thought there were eight planets on there and I threw them up there and I go well we don't know what they are so I'm like well maybe they're all in the same orbit so I put them all in the same orbital path and then they went nope they're at this AU this AU and this AU so I had to rewrite that part of the book to figure out that they were at this distance this distance this distance I know you end up being an amateur astrophysicist and, you, and I figured out the mass of a star can include uh, moons too. So I plotted out different moons for each of them and stuff like that. I came up with all these bodies and stuff like that and threw names on them and whatnot. You did that in PowerPoint? Or? Yeah, it's on PowerPoint. You want to go this one? I got it. I got it. Yeah, yeah. I got it. How many how many applicants yeah. are here? That's all. I got one. You got to do that. You got to have visual aids. I have to have visual aids. I'm a very visual. Well, it's like we were talking about Google Maps, and did you, if you go, if you can do search for my maps through Google Maps, and you can create custom maps and put your own, and relabel everything, and you can even attach pictures. Like if you're doing historical writing, you can plug in historical pictures or add links and make your own custom map. They have all of the different icons that you can add. You can add lines. So if you're mapping out uh, where like trolley lines are or where roads used to be or didn't used to be. You can map, you can do your own overlay, and then you can have different layers of that that you can click on and off visibility, and it's all saved within your Google. That's fun. And it's just yeah. look for Google My Maps, and you can set up your own custom map. You can do it for a modern trip, but it's also fantastic for historical writing. Mm -hmm. Plotting into the future, uh, trying to figure out where roads would be gone and mm -hmm. where bridges have washed out, and how are you going to travel now? It's been five years, it's been ten years, yeah. whatever. That's been really fun. Just figuring out how things would be without maintenance after so long. That's yeah. always interesting. Yeah. Well, it's like, yeah, things like that change. I mean, yeah. they degrade so quickly. Yes. Yeah. That Google by Maps also is a vector, so you can track distances. Right? Yes. Like yes. Yeah. How long is it going to take someone when they have horses? You know? Yeah. It's, that's hilarious watching the old westerns. It's like, yeah, we're going to zip up from Nogales to Abilene. Yeah, we should be there in a few days. And it's like, good God, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Game of Thrones did that too. Yeah, Game of Thrones. So Game of Thrones, <laughs> so Game of Thrones just lost their half of <laughs> Let's take England and put this just a little bit over here. And yes, let's yeah, pop this show winter in half. I know. Let's turn Hadrian's Wall into ice. Yes. <laughs> okay. I, just, I felt bad about the end. You just kind of. I thought that was hilarious. The description was awesome. It's like. The last three seasons, that's what happens when you play D&D &D without a DM. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> was the Maybe best he gave up an outline, though. Yeah. Then, um, and then uh, what, somebody, I, I kept thinking, well, let's see what George actually writes now. And then I found out he's the executive producer, and it was just like, okay, maybe that was it. <laughs> but he says it, he says it won't line up, though. Oh, yeah, well, he did. Says it, yeah, it's different. I got to say, I was at last year, or two years ago. The South and the Lumber anyway, Con. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, our guests, thank you very much. Thank you. Tell us where you'll be next. Yeah. Tomorrow. 11.30 tomorrow morning, I'm making an announcement of uh, significant historic importance. Okay. Um, Seriously, tomorrow. I'm not full of air. I made a discovery that is going to change how we understand ancient Egyptian Damn. history. Mm -hmm. I'm not. This is a what time? It's 11:30. It's called Alter Your Reality. Uh, oh, I'm not ready to do that.
management. Yes, and uh, I'm going to be at Spoon Management at 11.30, so if you want to know how to juggle depression and other oh, issues right. and things like that, and your spoons, think about like hit points, in terms of this panel. Yeah. 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 There's actually games with sanity points. Yeah. Yes, there are. We had one, uh, the editor's speed reading, so you, uh, newbie or not so new writers, bring your first pages, and we will. We'll see, I could, I could be on your panel too, though. Right? Yeah. We'll, only, we'll only do paper cuts. Yeah. <laughs> Diana, do you we do won't leave your precious first page all like bloody with like like writing for games, like well, just, for just for games that I have played with my players. You don't do like if someone had. Publish their own game and needed like some narrative or some. I could, I suppose. You'd be open to yeah, that. I could. I'm next at Playing Well with Others collaborative work at Fourth Gen Tomorrow. And I have a very trying co worker, so I can speak to them. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they're more trying than others. Is yes. that what you're saying? You're very oh, trying. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, very much. Oh, and last, if anybody wants. Hello, this is Eric and Wendy Strzok with Stone Valley Hobby and Game. We sell board games, card games, role-playing games, and supplies. We have thousands of Magic the Gathering cards available, carry Kickstarter products, and work with veteran-owned small businesses to bring you our own line of products. We are a small business retailer, but we offer competitive prices, a loyalty system, and free shipping on orders over $100. As a military veteran myself, I'm a strong supporter of our armed forces, their families, and contractors out there doing the hard job. So any order from an AA, AE, or EP address will be shipped absolutely free. Remember, StoneValleyGames.com, where we take your leisure seriously. Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. And feel free to enjoy our other shows, such as D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition, and Scion, Ragnarok and Roll, a Scion hero to Ragnarok story. Thank you for listening.